Hi everyone, my name is Miranda Anderson and I'll be discussing the ecological interactions of this non-Indigenous sea anemone, Diadomini lineata. This project was supervised by Dr. Chris Harley at the University of British Columbia. To give you a bit of an overview for the presentation, I'll be beginning with some background information on non-Indigenous species, including Diadomini, before getting into my research questions. I'll go over the methods and results for each of those questions before summarizing the overall findings. So non-Indigenous species can be defined as any species that is introduced outside of its natural past range. And this is often mediated by shipping or the spread of aquaculture. As you can see in this map here, over 80% of marine regions have been uh, impacted by at least one harmful non-Indigenous species. And these harmful impacts can range from reducing biodiversity to habitat quality or even outcompeting Indigenous species. I should note, however, that not all non-Indigenous species are harmful. They can also be neutral or beneficial in their invaded range. So to focus in on BC for a moment, uh, these are some of the non-Indigenous species that came to mind for me. Uh, you can see in the top row that there's some Pacific oysters, Sargasm muticum, the European green crab, and in the bottom right we have the orange striped green sea anemone, that's Diadomini lineata. So this will be the focus for the rest of the presentation. Uh, it is a small clonal species with a broad range of environmental tolerances. It's indigenous to the Pacific coast of Asia, but is now known to be the most widely distributed sea anemone across the globe. And despite this prevalence, not a lot is known about its ecological role or impact on local ecosystems. To address this gap in our knowledge, I'll be asking two research questions. The first being, what are the trophic relationships of diatomini and how might they limit its distribution? And given what's known about common characteristics of non-Indigenous species, uh, we predicted that diatomini will have few Indigenous predators, but a large breadth of prey. And the second question relates to its ecological impact in BC, whether it should be classified as an invasive species. And we predicted that diatomini will have a negative impact on the Indigenous intertidal community structure, especially in terms of biodiversity. So to explore this first question, we wanted to know what the dietary breadth of the species is. We explored this by conducting a series of laboratory-based uh, feeding trials. Very simply, we put an anemone in a petri dish and added a potential prey item to that dish, recorded uh, whether that prey item was ingested after 24 hours. And to give you a sense of what their feeding behavior looked like, I wanted to share this video. It's sped up 10 times. I've just added some mosquito larvae to this dish. And as you can see, when they come in contact with the anemone, they stick to the tentacles and are brought to the mouth and then sort of sucked off. I thought that was kind of a, a, a cool thing that I wanted to share for you all. So this is one of the graphs that we produced from this trial. And as you can see, a lot of different prey items were in fact ingested by uh, these anemones. Some of the more commonly ingested uh, prey items include small crustacea. Um, and this isn't too surprising because they sort of are some of the smaller things that you see occurring in the tide pools with these anemones. We were also surprised to see our control, which was glass beads, were ingested more than 25% of the time. So this led us to question whether or not these ingested items are actually being digested. And here's that same graph now broken down into levels of digestion. As you can see, the glass beads were in fact not digested. So a graph like this suggests that uh, while these anemones may uh, consume whatever they come in contact with, they may not be digesting that um, and rather spitting it back out after a certain period of time. Um, so for that reason, digest digestion might be a better proxy for uh, potential uh, prey item preference. We wanted to explore this further by looking at some fecal pellets collected from the field. We saw a lot of different cool things under the microscope, including some barnacle cyprids, amphipod cuticle, and barnacle molts. Um, we also saw some other surprising things in the field, such as uh, a lot of terrestrial insects, actually, such as ants and moths and mosquitoes. So this supports our hypothesis overall that uh, diadomini is a generalist uh, feeder and will sort of try to eat whatever it can. 
We then wanted to look at what indigenous predators might prey upon diatomini. So we first conducted some uh, very similar feeding trials in the lab to identify uh, what potential predators might actually eat diatomini. Uh, we used this data to then inform field surveys where we looked at any pos possible correlations between potential predator and anemone abundance at 20 different field sites across Vancouver. These are some of the predators that we looked at. And from the lab, we determined that this leather star, Dermasterius, and Hermacenda, the opalescent nudibranch, uh, will consume diadomini quite frequently. Um, however, the data from the lab, or sorry, the data from the field doesn't quite support this. And a possible reason for that is the high number of non-zero data points. Another reason could be that these predators were starved for two weeks in the lab and weren't given uh, any other prey items to choose from. So it's possible that while they will eat diadomini in the lab, um, they may prefer indigenous prey items in the field. We did have some pretty cool um, data from these surveys though. So these surveys were initially done in 2016 to determine the distribution of diadomini across Vancouver. Um, and the orange dots here represent points where diatomini was found. So that's six out of 20 here in 2016. And then when I redid this, this uh, past field season, I found that eight out of 20 now had diatomini and seven out of those eight had increased in abundance since the surveys in 2016. So this sort of confirms the importance of looking at uh, ecological impact because the species is increasing in abundance and seems to be having some range expansions across Vancouver. So that brings us to our second question of what is the ecological impact of diatomini in BC? So to address this, we first wanted to look at the impact of anemone density on tide pool biodiversity. We did this by manipulating uh, anemone density of 30 high shore tide pools in West Vancouver by applying one of three treatments to each. So the first being ambient density, uh, the natural occurring density of anemones in these pools were four individuals per 10 centimeters squared, uh, just to give you a sense of how many we were finding. Um, the next treatment was zero, so we removed all of the anemones from a pool and then added them to the elevated treatment. And these treatments were maintained over the course of six months as we census them for species abundances in order to measure the change in Shannon diversity over time. This is the graph we produced from this experiment. Um, on the y-axis, we have change in mean Shannon diversity of marine uh, macroinvertebrates. And as you can see, we're not seeing uh, much of a pattern here. We expected that the uh, removed treatment would see an increase in uh, diversity over time and that the elevated treatment would see a reduction in uh, diversity over time, but it doesn't appear that the anemone has any impact on biodiversity. Something we noticed while we were conducting this experiment was that uh, mussels and anemones were often found in association with each other. So in this image here, you can see that uh, this anemone is settled on this mussel. Uh, we wanted to explore this potential facilitative relationship further by conducting another field experiment where we basically dug out a mussel bed in West Vancouver and cemented in these terracotta saucers and then added uh, mussels to half of them and left the others, the other half without muscles, and then added five anemones to each and monitored the change in anemone abundance over time. And what we found was that uh, over the course of the initial six hours after uh, adding the anemones, there was a gradual increase in the number of individuals attached uh, as we had expected. And at the end of the six hours, we did see that uh, the muscle treatment had slightly more uh, individuals attached uh, than the non-muscle treatment. We then uh, returned to these uh, saucers after three days and found that a significant number of anemones were attached in the muscle treatment over the non-muscle treatment. So this suggests that um, initial settlement and recruitment may be facilitated by muscles. However, we found that um, when monitoring these uh, artificial tide pools over the period of two months, uh, a different pattern or no pattern was 
uh, observed. So uh, it's possible that these muscles facilitate the initial settlement, but do not um, facilitate retention over time. So returning to these uh, two research questions that we had, uh, to answer the first one, we found that diatomini will consume a variety of prey, which supports the uh, generalist hypothesis that we had. Um, we also found that it's predated upon by Dermasterius and Hermesenda in the lab. However, there was no correlation between, between potential predators and diatomini in the field, which again supports our hypothesis that uh, diatomini will have few indigenous predators. In terms of ecological impact, we found that uh, there isn't an apparent effect of anemone density on biodiversity, and mussels may facilitate uh, settlement, but not retention. We're exploring this potential facilitative relationship further in the lab. Thank you very much for everyone that made this uh, project possible. <laughs>